Spirit moves and 
Hello. <laughs> Apologies. Didn't turn on the microphone. Good evening, everyone. So good to see you all here this evening. So good to be in the house of the Lord and just to have some moments to just be in his presence and get in his word and fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you would just join with us for a few moments as we worship the Lord. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King of all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings the whole earth back to the Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King of our King. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you will take my place. That you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Let's sing worthy again. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy. Worthy, this is amazing grace. Hallelujah. This is a 
and fell in love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. generation falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the land your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry Holy, all creation cries. Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy forever. And if you've been forgiven, if you've been redeemed, sing the song forever to the Lamb. Yes. And if you walk in freedom, and if you bear His name, and sing the song forever to the Lamb. We'll, we'll sing the song forever and amen. And the Angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. Hear your people sing, hear your people sing. Holy to the King of Kings. Holy, you will always be. Holy, holy forever. Yes, your name. Your name is the highest. Your name. Is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all your name your name your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name Stands above them all, yes. All 
thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all and the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever, hear your people sing, holy, to the King of kings, holy, you will always Can you sing it out? Cry, holy, yes, all creation cries. Lift your voice. Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, yes, holy forever. Hear your people sing. Hear your people sing, holy to the King of kings, holy, you will always be, holy, holy forever, yes, we declare that you are holy and that you're righteous, that you are perfect in all your ways, and that heaven is your throne and the earth is your footstool, and you are the great and mighty and majestic and holy King of kings, and Lord of lords, we stand in awe of you, Lord, and we want to be more like you. You said for us to be holy as you are holy, Lord, so teach us teach us, lead us, guide us into all truth, that, we may, that may, we may be more like you, Lord. We declare that you are holy, and we love you so much, and we're grateful to come into your house again and to be with you and to hear your word tonight. And so we open up our hearts to receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen, amen. Well, welcome again to Lighthouse Church. So good to see you guys here. Thanks for coming. Before you have a seat, just take a moment and greet your neighbor. Shake a hand, hug a neck. Say hello. see everybody. Just keep playing lightly, just a little bit. While we were singing, I just, the Lord challenged me. You know, Wednesday nights is really our, is our discipleship moment. You know, outside of our small groups and things like that. Sunday mornings we, we teach and we maybe learn some principles and thoughts like that, but but really, the goal on Wednesday nights is to get into a deep dive, into a into just something just a little bit deeper. And I had the privilege this week of going twice. I went Sunday night and I went last night to uh, a living faith crusade, or they don't call it a crusade anymore because crusades is when people died. They called it a conference now. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Even <laughs> wokeness, I'm just telling you, that's all it is. So they call it a living faith crusade conference now, because we don't want to call it a crusade, because people died, you know, so, um, but the atmosphere reminded me of something, and never been to this church before, never, never was there, but when the ministry of the worship team got done, there was a moment there that challenged my, not my belief in any way. But really, it was more of a challenge to remember. We're going to use a scripture tonight from the book of Jude, and it talks about putting people in remembrance of things. But I want you to do me a favor and just close your eyes. And I just want you out of your own mouth. We, we were led in some beautiful songs. But, you know, the Bible says that, that out of our spirit we worship the Lord. We don't worship the Lord because of what's on the screen. We don't worship the Lord because of what the song leaders sing. We worship the Lord because of what comes out of our spirit. So if you want to just for a moment just pray in tongues, pray in tongues. If you want to pray in English, pray in English. If you want to just say, I love you, Lord, 75 times, say, I love you, Lord, 75 times. But I want to I take a moment right now where each of us out of our own spirit speak to the Lord. Would you do that for me with me real quick and just play just a little bit louder so people aren't just a little nervous? But Lord, I'm not... Father, that just takes us to that place that's just a little bit deeper, just a, a little bit clearer, Heavenly Father. Lord, we, we've come in this middle of the week, and, 
And God, some of us, it's just been a rough week. And some of us, Heavenly Father, in the room, we've maybe we've had some victories. And maybe we've thrown around 270 bags of mulch like Pastor Barry. We've been to hospitals. Babies were born. Maybe tragic things have happened this week. But God, in this moment, we just, we lay that all aside and we remember the one who's greater than all of it. You're the strength and the supply. You are the hope everlasting. And God, we just worship you. We just worship you out of our, out of our known tongue and of our own unknown tongue. Oh, we worship you. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name. You know, you can be driving to work, just praying the Holy Spirit. You can be doing your hair, curling it, and have a conversation with the Lord. Well, you can't, I can't curl my hair. I don't have a lot to curl. But, 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 but what I'm saying, though, is, is that you can have a conversation with God. I don't know what you're walking through family, extended family, children, parents. I'm telling you, God can do something amazing. There's no distance in the Spirit. When you pray in the Spirit, guess what? You release the Spirit of God to do things. You don't know what you're praying, the Bible says. That's okay. Don't try to figure it out. Just pray. Just pray. Amen? By the way, how many bags of mulch did you actually do? 230. I thought it was 270, so I was pretty close. <laughs> Give it up for Pastor Barry. 230 bags of mulch today. Hallelujah. They, they've got a wedding coming to their house this weekend. And Pastor Barry, well, actually, Pastor Candy has a list for Pastor Barry to accomplish. So, and he's just, yes, ma'am. It's all good. That's what he keeps saying. It's all good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're glad that you're here. Hey, um, just wanted to let you know we just got a few things that are coming up. I did not even talk to you all back there. So if we got some slides that you want to give me that are probably right on point, I'm going to let you go ahead and throw the first slide up there and we'll make a mention of it. We've got the men's breakfast coming up on April the 20th. And you can text breakfast and get that signed up, $7 each for that. Men, we'd love to see you there for that. I think the next weekend is the women's spring luncheon. And it's going to be a lot of fun. April the 27th, that's coming up. We've got, I think, what, 16, 15, 16, 17 people already signed up for that. And we would love to see 60 to 70. So bring your friends. Bring your, bring your kids. Bring your, you know, but you got to register. When do you have to register by? we got two more weeks to register. The cost is $25. That pays for your lunch and all that kind of good stuff that you're going to have. It's really a lot of fun. This is a really neat tool. We've had people come that don't come to our church that have incredible opportunities of ministry. So you put them in, into an opportunity where they can have ministry, and God will minister. You just got to get them here. And so we've got Shalane, and I think the name of the, I can't read it. I'm so sorry. What's their, their group called? The truth is, and, and it's not a singing group, it's a teaching group. And so they, they tag team teach. And so it's going to be amazing. You don't want to miss out on that, ladies. April 27th, cost is $25, 11 to 1. Please register and register quickly. All right, what else have we got back there that just might be something worthwhile? Is there anything else coming up? All right, let me just make a mention of something that's really fun. And how many of you like it when, I'm, I'm going to segue into our offering appeal, but, but how many of you like it when things begin, when, when, when change happens? Does anybody love change? Anybody love change? I've got a few folks that love change. All right, we're going to do some, we're going to have some change here at Lighthouse Church, and, and we're excited about it, but we're going to be doing some demo in the office area, and we're going to be renovating some things for our nursery. We're going to bring the nursery upstairs so that the, kid, the babies are closer to the moms and the dads. And so that starts next Monday. And so at the end of service, for any strong men, I've only got probably literally 10 minutes of work left because I've done most of it already. But if you could help us, we've got a desk to move, two desks to move and a couple of other things that we need to move. But if you could help us after service, that would be fantastic and it would be amazing. Pastor Melody has got a huge vision. I am so excited to be able to just launch into her vision. But you know what vision requires? Vision requires resources. And so I want to challenge you. Does everybody, have a, does everybody have an offering tonight? Does anybody need one? I've got multiple singles. I've got multiple singles. Does anybody need one? Hey, Gary, there's a gal right there that needs one. Would you help me with it? 
Go ahead, help, help her with it. All right, I want everybody to put something in the offering. Does anybody need another one? I got another one. I got another one. Dana, you, you need one? No, does anybody else need one? All right, we need another one. All right, we need everybody to participate. So if you don't have any money in your pocket, I'm, I've got some money. Anybody need anything else? All right, so everybody's going to participate. Amen. It's so good to see Mike back in the house. So good to see you, Mike. Appreciate you being here, brother. All right. You know what? The expansion of the kingdom. God doesn't need your money. He he really doesn't. God is a supplier. God's a meter of needs. And because he's a supplier and he's a meter of of needs, all we have to do is yield to his leading. And so when, when opportunities come our way, you know, we're, we're looking at doing some remodels in the, in, the, in, the, in the office area and down in the children's and the youth and the gym area. But then we're also looking at possibly doing something out in the field over there that would cause families to come to our property, like building a little pavilion maybe where people could come sit under, on a picnic table and have a safe place for their kids to play, you know. We're just, we're just we're, that's not happening. It's not, on the, it's not on the books yet, but it's vision. It's vision. And you know what? I always believe this, that money follows ministry. I believe it with all of my heart. The more ministry we do, the more opportunity people are going to want to participate. Because we know that souls are being saved, lives are being changed, people are being set free. Homes are being rekindled and, 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 and love is being established. And so I believe that with all of my heart. We've got kids down in the youth room right now that are just, they're hearing the word. We've got children upstairs with Pastor Melody, and they're, and they're learning the Bible. You know, we live in a world right now where we be, we've become biblically illiterate, and Pastor Melody and Derek, this staff, Pastor Barry, Pastor Candy, and myself, Pastor Nancy, we desire, we desire our church to become biblically literate. That's why we challenge you to bring your Bibles. So let's pray over the offering, and let's go right into the word. Father, We love you and thank you for the opportunity to give. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that in all that you do, we give you praise. Father, thank you for the resources that this church has received to allow us to do renovations, Father. And those renovations are not just duct tape and bailing wire. They've done, they're done professionally. God, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the vision of our pastoral staff. We thank you for the vision that's in the church. We thank you for the vision for reaching the next generation and the next generation. Father, everything that we're doing today is sowing seed into the tomorrows of what's going to come to pass. And God, we pray right now that it would come to pass where we might even be able to see it. God, we thank you for this offering. We pray that you'd cause it to be a miracle in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church, as you're able to give. everyone for participating in the offering. We have had some amazing offerings over the last couple of weeks. Pastor, uh, pastor, (laughs) one of these days, Tammy's just going to be a pastor. We're just going to call her pastor. But Tammy was telling me just about how faithful, how faithful this church is. I never know what people give, but there's always something coming. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Well, what we're going to do is I I just, I want to, I want to start with a thought. Everybody got your Bible? Everybody got a notebook, your handy-dandy notebook? Anybody watch cartoons? I had children, and the handy-dandy notebook was Dora, Dora the Explorer. And she, it's Blue's Clues. Oh, thank you so much for the correction. I thought it was Dora the Explorer. But, but, but my, kid, my kid watched Blue's Clues, too. So, but, 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 but you had your handy-dandy notebook and your pencil, and uh, they would draw things on that thing. But you know what? If you get bored, you could doodle. I mean, it's okay. You know, or, or put your shopping list down there. It's okay. That doesn't bother me. At least the night's productive. Amen? Amen. We want to go to church. We don't want to waste time. We want it to be productive. Amen? How many times, Pastor Barry, have you been listening to a preacher, and all of a sudden the Lord gave you a word, and you stopped listening to the preacher and started writing a sermon? I've done that. I can't tell you how many times. God begins to say something. God begins to do something. 
Maybe it's something for your business. Maybe it's something for your family. Maybe it's a download. Because ultimately, when you're in, in the environment where the Holy Spirit is speaking to people, when we're in that environment, guess what? And we are open. That's why we sing songs. So we open our spirit. We open our spirit to hear. And guess what happens? God begins to download to you. And I, and I, I, I honestly, I, I, obviously, I would love for you to listen to me. But if God's given you something that's better than me, listen to God. Everybody okay? It's okay. I mean, I don't, I don't take offense, okay? I would much rather you listen to God than listen to me any day of the week. You know, over the last couple of, the last couple of weeks, Pastor Candy has asked us some very, very strategic questions. And I think in asking these very strategic questions, they have challenged us in our Christian walk. And, and I think it's important that our walk with God is constantly in challenge. And I'm not talking about it's difficult, but challenging us to go to the next level. Amen? I, I think every one of us in this entire series, the Dare to Be, the Dare to Be series has been, I'm here, I'm going to dare you to go there. I, 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 you're here, but I'm going to dare you to go here. Because at, at the end of the day, when we read the book of Acts, the book of Acts is the, is the blueprint for today's church in the way that we ought to be functioning and that we ought to be communicating, the way that we ought to be teaching and the way we ought to be ministering. So she asked you questions like this is, how is my love walk right now? Is your love walk in a right place right now? Has somebody cut you off today that all of a sudden your love walk went out the window? Anybody ever have that happen to them? No, no, just keep looking forward. Have you thought about how you want to finish? Had the privilege of visiting one of our senior saints in the hospital today. And here this gal is in her 90s, going to be 91 on June the 3rd. And she is like, you know, when most people are just saying, I'm ready to be done, you know what she said to me, Miss Joyce? I can't wait for my Tuesday Bible study, to get back to my Tuesday Bible study. I said, why don't you just do it here? She said, why would I want to do it here? I want to do it at home. So that, you know, th she's still looking at tomorrow. She's not done yet. She's, she's looking towards what she gets to do. How many of you want to have that kind of attitude at 90 years old that I look forward? And you know what? Can I, just can I just tell on you guys for a minute? Their Bible study is not just a little Bible study. It starts about 10 o'clock in the morning, goes to about noon, and then at about noon they go to Cracker Barrel and they eat lunch together. And then they come back after Cracker Barrel and they play Rummy Cube all afternoon. And they might get done about 6 o'clock at night. That is a Bible study right there. And she's looking forward to the Bible study. Hallelujah. How do you want to finish? How am I running my race? You know, I was thinking of that famous runner. That famous runner, she was running with all she had, Zola Bud. I don't know if you've ever remembered the Olympics where Zola Bud was running, and she tripped that other gal, or she herself tripped. I can't remember which one. But she got up and she kept running. Or how about that guy that was running in the, in the Olympics and he all of a sudden pulled a hamstring and he started hobbling as he was coming. And he was, I think, from Barbados or something like that. And he was hobbling all the way in. And, and all of a sudden people were coming up to him and they said, you can finish. And they said, no, I, I came to finish, not just to run. I came to run. I came to run a race. How aware am I? That was a great question last, last week, Pastor Candy. How aware of the culture am I? I know that the culture, we, know, we, we, we want to indict it and send it to hell. Do you understand what I'm saying? But the reality is, is how, am, how aware am I of that every single person that is out there still needs the Savior that you and I claim that we have? Amen? How aware am I in coming in contact with these people on a regular basis that they need Jesus just as much as I need Jesus? Am I paying attention? Each one of us have questions that should take us to a deeper walk, a deeper spirituality, and a, a deeper intimacy with God, and a deeper level in my personal discipleship. And, and so as I was studying, you know, we've tried over the last 18 months, I think, or so is how long we've been going through this thing, is we've tried to establish a culture of discipleship. It's, it, it's, it, it, it's important that that culture be important and embedded in us. Because if we don't continue to grow, if we don't continue to develop, we cannot make one until we first be one. I still wear that crazy bracelet that I've gotten a little over a year ago. So many people are more concerned about what others think about them than what God thinks, and this affects how effective we really are in reaching people. 
So the first thought that I wanted to share with you tonight is just simply this. Disciples are willing to yield. Disciples are willing to yield. And I'm not talking about necessarily yielding in a way that we would say, well, I just prefer you. But it's a yielding that says, you know what, not my way, but thy way. You know, when, when I think about this word yielding, the, the Bible tells me in the book of Luke, and, and Jesus is very clear here. If you have a red-letter Bible, the book of Luke chapter 9, verse 23 says this. It says, then he, Jesus, said to the crowd, if any of you want to be my follower, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be someone who claims me, look at what he said. He said, you must give up your own way. In other words, you must yield. Did you know that Romans chapter 2, 12, verses, verse 2 says this, that, the, that there must be a yielding of our mind and to, to, to not the way the world thinks, but a yielding of my mind to the way, the, the way that God thinks. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. He goes on to say, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way and take up your cross daily. Nobody likes to think of crucifixion except for Easter. But what have you had to crucify today? Have you had to crucify an opinion? Have, have you had to crucify some words that you did not want to say? Did you have to crucify some thoughts that you wanted to let become words? Are there things in you that you have to crucify? You know, and then the next one, it says, and then he said, follow me. He says, if you try to hang on to your life, look at what he says, you'll lose it. If you try to do it your way and not my way. Now, now we're trying to build disciples. Does that make sense? If we're building disciples, we cannot hang on to the way we do it. We have to hang on to the way he does it. Because, he says, but if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? See, true discipleship is much more than just the transfer of information. It infers a couple of things. The imitation of the teacher's life. Uh, Paul made this statement. He said, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. I would trust and hope that my life would be one that somebody would say, Bob, how did you do that? Show me how you did that. Show me how you're living that way. And you know, when you have a conversation with someone, what are, we, what are we doing with that teacher's life? It's instilling his values, and it's reproducing his teachings in us. It reflects a relationship. Well, let me, let me back up real quick, right quick. All of us have favorite teachers. You all know who my favorite teacher is, obviously because of where I went to school. I went to Rhema Bible College. But I've had other great teachers as well. I've had, I've had, I've had Eddie, Eddie Turner. I've had, I, I've had Maury Davis. I've had other great teachers like Doug Jones and Tony Cook. I've had other, not just, not just Kenneth Hagin, but, but what is it that I see in them? It's, it's how would they think about this? How would they read this scripture? How would they deal with this situation? That's when I'm really truly becoming a disciple because I'm wanting to imitate what they do and how they speak. And see, if I do that well, it reflects in my relationship in following them, adhering to their life because their teaching shapes my view of the world. And, and in the heart of a disciple, there is a desire. There's a decision or a settled intent. It's, it's I've made a decision. My life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. And so if I, have, if I am not my own and I've been bought with a price, I no longer live, yet it's the Christ that liveth in me that ought to be living. See, a disciple of Christ desires above all else to be like him. What are the attributes of Jesus today that you are trying to implore into your life or to, uh, trying to employ into your life? What are, what are the attributes of Jesus if you were to look at, the, at, at who he is? What specific attributes of Jesus are not in Bob, not in Dana. They're not in you. If those attributes are absent in us, guess what happens? We now have a responsibility as disciples to begin to, uh, our attempt at the imitation of who our 
disciple maker is. Did you know that the term disciple is used 269 times in your New Testament? Never looked it up until the other day. 269 times. But the word Christian is only used three times. In the Bible, it's very interesting to me, but in the Bible, a disciple and a Christian were interchangeable. You know what we've done, sadly, in the church today? We've separated them. We can be a Christian but not a disciple. But that's not true because the Bible doesn't teach us that. The Bible doesn't say, I can be a Christian. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior, and that's all I have to do. No, what we had to do was be willing to give up our life because many of them lost theirs. Again, we live in an America, not in the world. See, if you've never left the country, you don't, it's very difficult to have a, of a worldview. It's very difficult to see how the rest of the world sees us. I was studying this week, and out of the book of Disciplines by Dallas Willard, he made this statement. He said, discipline is the primary, I'm sorry, disciple is the primary term used in the Gospels to refer to Jesus' followers. And it is a common referent to those known in the early church as believers, Christians, brothers or sisters, those of the way, or saints. So there was an identity as a disciple. But we say Christian. I'm a Christian. But what would, what, would, what would happen if we, even in the church, decided to say, well, I'm a disciple? Guess what the next question is going to be? Of who? Right? Because a Christian, it's self-explanatory. But when we say disciple, it now all of a sudden says, well, who, who are you a disciple of? Are you a disciple of Buddha? Are you a disciple of Muhammad? Are you a disciple of, Right? I, I, I identify as a Christian, I understand that, but there's a weight in the word and the terminology of a disciple. In the time when Christianity became a force that turned the world upside down, the terms disciple and Christian were used interchangeably. Many of us try to be disciples, but James challenges us to make us, to, to make us more than, an, than, than just an attempt. And I'm going to be getting to our passage in the book of Acts in just a minute. But you know what? I get to teach this week and next week. So no matter how long I take tonight, I can go to next week and it doesn't worry about it. Hallelujah. And I don't even have to say where I'm finishing. Hallelujah. But number two, let, let me share this thought with you. I shared with you that disciples are willing to yield, but disciples are also doers. So what am I saying when I, when I say many of us try to be disciples? Many of us try. But the Bible doesn't say, hey, try being a Christian. It doesn't say try to be a disciple. It says be a doer. And, and see, that's really hard for us. Because when we come across something in the Word, there's something that happens to us when we see something that's difficult. And we choose not to employ that or release that into our life yet. The, James said this in James chapter 1, verse number 22. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. He said, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Is it okay to talk to a small group tonight? I'm not worried about offending any of y'all because you guys are the Bible study students. You're the ones that came out on a Wednesday night. But you know what? It, it says that we're not just supposed to listen to it. If you listen to the word and you don't obey, it's like glancing at, a, at, at your face in a mirror. Keep going. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. It says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. See, the, the results for trying is this, and, and I'm just basically pulling the antithesis or the, the what, it's the antonym or the, not the synonym is the same, right? Synonyms are the same. Antonyms are the, diff, are, are, are the opposite. So if we just try, the results of trying in our lives are these things, foolishness, lack of obedience, bondage, and the invitation to curses in our lives. See, when I, when I really look at just, hey, if this is what it's saying and this is what I get, what's the opposite? That would be the individual that just tries or doesn't even make the effort. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, the very opposite is, is what the doer receives. 
See, there's incentives for being a doer. And let me just share just a few of these with you. You don't have these, and they're not up there as I studied more. This is the problem. I wrote my notes on Monday, and I studied them again today, and I added more to it. So that's why I know that I'm probably not going to get finished today. So anyway, but, but there's, there are incentives for being a doer. What's an incentive? Anybody know what an incentive is? Ladies, you go to Kohl's. It's called Kohl's Cash. Right? That's an incentive, right? The funniest thing, my wife will come home and say, hey, honey, I got $10 in Kohl's cash, but what did that cost me? 50 bucks. She got $10 in Kohl's cash, but I got 50. Pastor Candy, you've never done that to Pastor Barry, have you? All right, she's just going to smile. Number one, Jesus related to doers. It's interesting. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter 12 and verse 50, it says, anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, a sister, and a mother. Matthew 12, 50. Matthew 12, 50. He says, anyone who does the will, not just thinks about it, not just responds to it, but anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother. So he's relate, he relates to you and me. When I become a doer of the word, we become family with Jesus. We become familiar with him. We, 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 Jesus relates himself to the doers of the word. Number two, Jesus recognizes the doers. Did you know that? He doesn't just relate to us as brother, sister, father, mother. He relates to us, but he also recognizes doers. Romans 2.13. Romans 2.13. If you want to write it down, you can write it down. It says this. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Did you hear what he said there? If you just listen to the word, if you just listen to somebody preach, if you just listen to somebody teach, but you don't become an active participant in that which is being taught, the Bible says we are not justified for just listening. I can sit in church all of my life, and I can listen and never become or never place action behind what we're talking about. If I never do that, the Bible says I'm not justified, but I am justified, or I am made righteous, or I am made whole if I become the one that becomes a participant in the things that God tells me to do. See, now, so, so, so not only does Jesus relate to doers and recognizes doers, he also releases abilities to doers. See, he, 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 he's not going to give you more than you're capable of dealing with. And what I mean by that is, is this. Remember the story of the, the talents? He gave some talents, more talents to the guy that was ta more talented, less talents to the guy that was mediocre or talent. But he still gave a talent. He still gave an opportunity. But what did that guy do with it? Nothing. He squandered it. He squandered that last talent, but Jesus released ability to doers. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And again, I'm sorry, she does not have these. These were added later on. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Jesus Christ. We, so we can do, say do, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So what does he do when we come into Christ and we become doers? The, the Bible says that we do these things that we're playing. Did you know I had the opportunity to pray for a mom before the baby was born the other day, and I just laid hands on her, and I just began to pray, and there was going to be a C-section. And so the baby, baby's wonderful, beautiful, big. <laughs> She's big. She's almost 10 pounds. But, but beautiful baby. But, but you know what? As I was praying and I do this when I'm, when I'm ever doing a, a baby dedication. I, I pray that that, that that baby was known even before it was created what its destiny and purpose was supposed to be. Did you know that you have that? Uh, you've got a purpose. You have a destiny. Just because you might be getting onto the, the sunshine or, or, or the sunset side of life does not mean that the destiny is over or completely fulfilled yet. Just like the sweet Miss Jan, she's, she is looking forward to a Bible study. Because guess what? We've all been called to do good works. But those good works don't happen without a doer. Can I get an amen? 
The good works don't happen without a doer. They're, they're, they're great ideas. They're pipe dreams until a doer says, I take my place and become the doer that, God, you've called me to be. What has God called you to be? I don't know. I can help you. Maybe I'll walk you through it. We've got a Sunday school class now that meets during first service to find out your spiritual gifts. Works perfect for that. By the way, Gary's got a, that was Nan, Pastor Nancy, but Gary's got a great class. He's teaching right now on, 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 on Bible stories, just bi- stories from the Bible. I want to encourage you, if you guys aren't in a Sunday school, go to a Sunday school class. The last one I want to share with you. So, number one, Jesus related to doers. Number two, he recognized doers. Number three, he released ability to doers. But also, guess what? He reveals redemption for doers. The Bible says in Revelation twenty two fourteen. Revelation twenty two fourteen. it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments. Did you know that there's a blessing that comes by doing the commandments and the call and, and the commission of God? He says this, they, th- that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Man, blessed are they that do. Blessed are they that do. Say, I'm going to be a doer. See, if we become the doers that God's called us to be, I'm not talking about a works mentality. I'm talking about a mentality that says, yes, God, what would you like me to do? God, where would you like me to go? Who would you like me to speak to? You're at Walmart, you know? I was trying to remember the other day where I was, and I walked out, and I turned around. Oh, I know where I was. I, was, I drove by James and Jessica's business. And I just drove right by their business. And I just prayed for them as I went by. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord said, go say hi. We didn't talk about nothing. They were working their tails off because they, they had a deadline they had to get done. But they were working their tails off. I just drove by and I just said, hey, guys, I don't need nothing. I just, I'm supposed to stop here. You know what? I believe that when we become doers of what God says to do, God releases not only blessings in you, but it creates blessings in others. And it becomes a blessing for others. Number, number three, this is, I'm just going through some things as I get ready to come into the book of Acts. Disciples are consistent and persistent. They're consistent and persistent. You know, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, and it says this, Do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you? Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do. Oh, there's that word again. What does it say? That you will do God's will. Then you will receive all that he promised. For in in, in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. There's that, there's that inference or, that, the, or that, uh, that indication that we've got to be finishers. We've got to be finishers. But that requires persistence and consistency. You know, some days we miss our Bible reading. That's okay. Start the next day because every day is a new day in God. Guess what? Start your Bible reading over. And over. But you know what happens is, is one day turns into two, turns into three, turns into four, turns into five. And what we begin to do is we begin to pull back and we, we begin to realize that, that, that when, that, and I'm not saying that we turn away intentionally. And I don't think this verse is actually saying that we, we make a decision to turn away. I think it's a diversion. How many of you know the enemy will use diversions all the time? I, I, was, I, was, I was talking to someone recently, and actually I was talking to Gary just before church. And I, I was talking to my mom earlier today, and I firmly believe this, that in the days in which we live, the church has become more comfortable with familiar spirits than Holy Spirit. Did you, did you hear what I said? I, I think we've become, we, we are less aware of Holy Spirit than we are familiar spirits. Because familiar spirits, they're good. They might even appear godly, but they're not God. They're, in a, they're, in a, they're a diversion and a, ver, and, and a version of who God is. And guess what begins to happen? We begin to listen to the voices of these other spirits. 
and we don't follow the voice of the Holy Spirit and our persistency and consistency, the only way you know the difference between the Spirit of God and a familiar spirit is the Word of God. Because you judge everything that the Spirit of God is going to say to you by this thing. And if, and if it sounds good, wow, that sounds good, but it's not God, the only way that you know is if you've vetted it by this. See, as, if we're building good disciples, I'm building people not to say, what did Bob or Candy or Barry or Nancy or Arvind or, uh, or, or Melody or, or Derek? I'm not building people that are going to do that. I'm building people that are going to build and say, what does the Word say? Because if I say what the Word says, the Word now becomes the trumpet in my life. And it becomes the warning signal when I hear that familiar spirit. Because what does he say in this verse? I don't think it started this way. Like I said, I don't think we start this way. But I think it says, my righteous ones will live by faith, but I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. There is an end result of being persistent, of being consistent in the word. Guess what happens? We're saved and we make it to the finish line. The challenge that we have, though, is so oftentimes there are other things. The result of inconsistency is personal destruction in this passage, causing even souls to be lost as a result. As a believer, do you understand that that there are people that are assigned to you to hear the good news of Jesus Christ? You have a responsibility. This sounds like, oh, Pastor Bob, you're making this hard. No, I'm talking to my Wednesday night crew. My Wednesday night crew, they're digger deeper. They're, they're, they're deep diggers. They're deep divers, if, that, if you understand what I'm saying. Why? Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to build something and cultivate something that is bigger and stronger than we are. Let me share this next one with you, and I'm going to eventually get to Book of Acts, probably just as we get ready to be done. Disciples understand that distractions have consequences. We understand. We just read a passage But disciples understand that distractions have a consequence. I can get distracted. Now, now what would be a good distraction? You know what could be a good distraction? My kids. Hey, Mom and Dad, we want to come over for dinner. And and you know what? I was going to do Bible study. Isn't that just the craziest little thing? Who would have thought that my kids, just enjoying life, want to come hang out with me? And instead of doing my Bible study, I'm hanging out with my kids. I'm not saying that my kids are of the devil. That's not what I'm saying. But isn't it amazing how subtle a distraction can come? Right? How subtle those distractions come. It could come in the form of health. It could come in the form of family. It could come in the form of a job. It could come in the form of finances. Did you know that finances are one of those, the, the, one of those awful things that are in terrible, terrible distractions? They're terrible. Terrible distractions. But disciples understand that distractions have consequences. I was reading the book of Jude one day. And if you have your Bible, I really want to encourage you to go here. I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation, so it might look a little different than what you are. But I, w- I really want to go to the book of Jude because Jude, he, he, he just gets real. He just gets plain. He had this intention of sharing a message that was so enthusiastic and so encouraging. He just wanted to talk about salvation. Amen? He said, but you know what? I can't talk about that. I can't talk about that. He says this in verse number 3, and I'm just going to read from 3 to 7. He said this in Jude, verse number 3. He said, dearly loved friends, if you don't have it, you can watch it over me. I had been eagerly planning to write to you about salvation that we all share. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the truth of the good news. Did you know what he's doing? He's writing to a group of disciples and saying, guys, I need to warn you. I need you to be careful. He's telling them, he's telling them very quickly, I'm sorry, he's telling them, I find that I must write. He is so compelled. There's something in him that is compelled to write about something else, urging you to defend the truth of the good news. God gave this unchanging truth 
Now, guys, we live in a day where in the church, things are changing all the time. Beliefs are changing all the time. I talked to my mom, like I said earlier today. I, I, I said, Mom, we, I got to talking about familiar spirits. And she said, she said, really? really? And she said, talk to me more about that. Now, this is the woman that taught me about those things. But because of the fact that in the church that they're in, they don't talk about those things. Guess what? It's now become a foreign subject to her 35 years later. So, so in this passage, we're seeing something. He's, God gave us an unchanging truth. Say unchanging. It doesn't change. Now, my delivery might change. I used to wear suits to church all the time. When I first got in ministry, I wore a suit on Wednesday night. I wore a suit on Sunday morning. At today, I'm, I'm relaxed. I got matching tennis shoes, as a matter of fact, to my shirt. That, who cares if that changes? That's irrelevant. But this word does not change. One of my biggest struggles right now, and I've shared this with you guys multiple times, one of my greatest struggles is how much they're changing the electronic versions of your Bible, and we don't even know it. All of my Bibles are old. I, don't have, I haven't bought a new Bible in years because I'm afraid that what's in there is different than what I've had. Because you know what? The number one, when, when it comes to, there's one translation, I think it's the NIV, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but I could be right, I think I'm right. But the NIV Bible is the same publisher that, they bought the rights to the NIV, is the same publisher that now writes the Satanic Bible. Why would they not want to rewrite some things? It's subtle. Well, let's just give it a little bit of a, 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 of a flair. I study in the King James, I teach out of the New Living so that it makes more sense. But, but, but you have to understand, if it's not, if it doesn't make sense in this newer version, I'm back in the King James. Not because it was good enough for Jesus and it was good enough for Paul, but because I believe that there was something anointed when it was written when they didn't have the technology that they have today. Okay, that's enough of my soapbox. Let me get back to my... Whew. It's an unchanging truth. Say it's an unchanging truth. Once and for all to his holy people. He says, I say this because some godless people have wormed their way in among you. Where is that? The church. The church. Saying that God's forgiveness allows us to live immoral lives. The fate of such people was determined long ago, for they have turned against our only, ma our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. This is what I want to show you. He, he goes into a reminder three times. Three times he reminds them of, of the results of people doing it the way they want to do it. I know this is a difficult message tonight. It's about discipleship, but we're building disciples. Amen, Pastor Candy? We're building disciples. And so this is what he says. I must remind you, and you know it well. That even though the Lord rescued the whole nation of Israel from Egypt, he later destroyed every one of those who did not remain faithful. That's a pretty powerful statement. God, who loved the children of Israel, destroyed those that were unfaithful. We think of God as only being this wonderful, smiley, happy. I showed you my picture on Sunday of my Jesus that I look at every day because I need the smiling Jesus. But can I tell you right now there is a severe Jesus? Can I tell you there's a severity to God? Okay, he says, but look at here. He says, and I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. They stepped out of line. They got out of alignment. See, guys, I, I, I'm going to trust you as we, as we build disciples. Guess what that does? It keeps us in alignment. It keeps our vehicle running straight. It keeps it from doing the, not do, having this shutter. Anybody have a tire ever go out of alignment? It just, uh, I walked in to see Miss Jane, Miss Jan today. Pastor Barry, did you see her? Were they doing the, the breathing treatment with her? They had this new thing on her. She was wrapped in this, in this, this little thing. And I walked in and she was going, Hi, Pastor Bob. It was shaking her body because she has a little bit of chest congestion. It was shaking her body to loosen that congestion, and it just made me laugh. But, you know, you stop and think about it. A car out of alignment never can reach its, fully, its fullest potential. 
As a matter of fact, it becomes very dangerous to drive if it gets too out of alignment. Look at what happened to the, to the angels of heaven that chose to get out of alignment with the authority of God. I'm talking to a group of disciples. Say, I'm a disciple. So if we're disciples, we don't get out of alignment with God. We don't get out of alignment with authority. We don't get out of alignment with, with what, what he's called us to do. Amen? And so he goes, oh, the authority of God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them chained in prison and darkness waiting for the day of judgment. So we know what's happening with them. So the first group, guess what? God, God punished those that were unfaithful. This group's chained. Look at what this group says. And don't forget. So three times he says, I remind you, I remind you. Oh, and by the way, don't forget. He says, don't forget the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with sexual immorality and even, and even a kind of sexual perversion. Every, that's supposed to be every. That's my fault. I spelt it wrong for Tammy. And every kind of sexual perversion. These cities were destroyed by fire and are, warn, are a warning of the eternal fire that will punish all who are evil. Now, this isn't to scare us. It's to remind us to stay faithful. It's a reminder to stay in alignment and under authority. It's a, it's a reminder to stay pure before God. See, as disciples, we understand that distractions have consequences. When I'm no longer faithful, I've gotten distracted right? When I'm no longer under authority and I'm no longer in alignment, I've gotten distracted. When, when I'm no longer, my mind doesn't remain pure. My mind doesn't, doesn't remain holy. My mind doesn't stay fixed upon the things of God. It moves me into this place of perversion, and there's penalties and consequences for all of those things. No fun. Say, I'm a disciple. I want us to be more than Christians. I want us to be disciples. Because discipleship should become very personal to every single one of us. It should become so personal to us that where is my walk right now? Where is my talk right now? Where is my thought right now? Where are my actions right now? Where are my words right now? Because ultimately at the end of the day, there are men and women that are running in the world that are confused. There are people that have come into our church that, that, that they're struggling with the burdens of a former self and God wants to set them free. But you know what? We've got to give them something that they want to see. We've got to give them something that they want to be. I'm not talking about a holier-than-thou mentality or attitude. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there is a genuineness about your faith. There is a truth and authenticness about your walk with Jesus. That people walk up to you and say, Pastor Bob, or Melody, or, 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 or Joyce, or May, or Martha, will you help me? I, I see it. I, I see it. Help me. Help me get there. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, when that happens, when discipleship becomes personal, I'm going to close with this. When discipleship becomes personal, and it becomes a, it becomes a desire, not just a byproduct, but a desire, guess what happens? The kingdom expands. It's a natural byproduct. See, the Christians and the disciples of the Bible wrecked the world. We didn't even get to it. We'll talk about it next week. But in Acts chapter 21, it was so fun to read the very beginning of Acts chapter 21. And we begin reading, and I think it was around 13, 14, 15 verses. It, it said this. It said, the, the, the Christians, the Gentile Christians, people were getting saved everywhere. The Jewish Christians, people were getting saved by the thousands in Jerusalem. Why? Because people were coming in contact with real Christians. They were coming in contact with disciples of Christ, not disciples of other things. Amen? Everybody okay? Did you learn anything tonight? Hopefully you did. Stand to your feet. Guess what? You're lucky enough to know that I've got several pages of notes that we'll be able to pick up right there next week. Hallelujah. Be careful. I might even study some more and have to bring you some more stuff. Pastor Candy, she's laughing at me because I know she does the same thing. Amen. Are you glad you gave yourself, you gave yourself a Wednesday night?
come to church, do me a favor. Ask one person. Ask one person. I want you to do me a favor. See that little card next to you? I'm not even going to give you a hard assignment. I didn't even put any on the front. Here, Pastor Kenny, I'll give you the one in my pocket. You got one in your purse? Pastor Barry, you got one? Okay. I want everybody to pick that up. I want you to hand it to somebody in church this Sunday that was not here tonight. Would you do that for me? I want you to do me a favor. I, I don't want you to take it out of the building. I'm going to give you a really simple assignment. I want you to take one card, hand it to somebody that was not here tonight. Can you do that for me? Say, I missed you on Wednesday. I want to give you a card. Praise the Lord. Everybody good? Let's just lift our hands toward heaven and go home. Father, we love you and thank you for this day. Thank you for all that we're getting to accomplish in you. Help us to become more like you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can help us for like five or ten minutes, clear out the offices. Gentlemen, we'd love for your help in the offices now. Just head that way. We, we'll, we'll, we'll give you direction in 20 seconds. God bless you. Have a good day.